readings again in Jesus' name. You can contact me on my website at standinthegap.org for all our new updates and files up there, and you can use it at your own discretion on your sites and your blogs if you like. And you can email me personally at uh, holdingfirmly at gmail.com if you just want to get a hold of me. In our channel, if you're not already a subscriber to our YouTube channel, you can go to YouTube and just type in Holding Firmly and then my full name, Mike Desario, and you'll get a good, pretty good selection of the videos if you don't already know some of the titles or haven't run across them in your searches. What I want to move into here is an explanation of why repentance and faith proven by deeds can only be preached from the side of full accountability and unhindered free will. It's impossible to preach proper repentance and faith proven by deeds from the moral depravity or defective nature, God's got to change your unwillingness to willingness, or any of those other things that they come up with to limit man's ability to obey God because they're afraid that man, given the ability to do that, is automatically going to be able to save himself and self-justify. But see, the thing is, is the scriptures show the 100% fairness of God in calling all men everywhere to repentance proven by deeds, all through the prophets, all through the apostles, Jesus Christ himself, likening the repentance required of you to that of Nineveh, where the people came clean before God, and then besought his mercy, saying, perhaps God will grant them mercy. That was the type of repentance to be required of you, to bring forth fruit worthy of repentance to show your sincerity by your deeds because you're able and free in your will to do those deeds. You've sold yourself into corruption to sin, yes, but you're not born dead in your sins. Now see, what we want to do here is start from the premise of Jesus was sent into the world like Matthew 1.21 says about he's going to, she's going to bring forth a son, a virgin is going to conceive and bring forth a son, call his name Jesus and he shall save his people from their sins. Now, this is from their sins is going to be a separation, a fleeing, a departing, a distancing themselves from their sins. As you say, the east is from the west, or he's going to remember them no more. Uh, meaning, clearly, it's going to save from the ruin and the corruption and the consequence, the final consequence of sin. So to be saved in that manner, through that method of repentance and faith proven by deeds, and then continue to sin or to allow you to continue to sin, would negate and contradict the whole entire purpose for which Christ came into the world. If the wretched man, Christianity, of profession Christianity, is valid, then it negates the entire gospel. Because you've got all this power at your disposal, you've got all this past, present, and future forgiveness, the magic transfer of Jesus' righteousness and obedience, all things possible through God, he can strengthen you and do all these things, but you can't stop sinning. And not only that, you have no accountability for your ongoing sins. Well, see, like, like I'm saying, my premise here is mainly to those that are outside the system. Most of us outside the system should be completely aware of this faith alone, substitution, no accountability, no matter what you do, it doesn't make any difference, gospel. We should be fully aware of those things. But it seems to me that there's still those that insist there's still something limited in man's capacity to obey God. That he still has to be empowered. God still has to change his will. Or do something to offset this depravity dwelling in his flesh. Well, again, there's nothing dwelling in his flesh. See, man's born with a moral conscience and natural inclinations. He's not born dead in sin. If he's born dead in sin, how do infants die in infancy go to go into paradise? See, all the old holiness preachers, because they believed in this moral depravity nonsense from the Westminster Confession, in faith alone, that you were justified in your sins by faith alone, they had to come up with an explanation why an infant that dies still goes to heaven. So they call it some kind of special grace. You know, many on the Calvinist side, and all they, if they're not elected, they go to hell. But then that came out of the twisted, lawyer-like minds of men that were always living in sin. So you're not born dead in your sin or defective in nature. You have a moral conscience and a natural inclinations and desires and inclinations. 
That's how man's born. So repentance has to be based on accountability in order to be fair. That's why God cannot justify you in your sins. See, it's illogical to tell people that God is going to save them in their sins and then afterwards turn around and tell them they're not going to inherit the kingdom if they continue in their sins. You tell the drunk, He's going to be justified before God. God's going to change his uh, desires so he'll be able to stop his drunkenness and his addiction. And then you turn around and you tell him he, I mean, you tell him he's justified. God accepts him as he is. He comes as he is, as a drunk. But then you turn around and tell him, based on 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, other passages, that drunkards will not inherit the kingdom, which, which of course, is true. So how is that fair then? See, if Christ was able to extend his mercy and his grace... To this person as a sinner, sinner saved by grace is all the church teaches, then how can he turn around and condemn him a second time for the same sins that he has previously forgiven? Well, because it's conditional and it's not future sins forgiven. Well, that's true. That's true. But why didn't sin, if sin has to stop to inherit the kingdom, final salvation is contingent on stopping sin. Initial salvation has to be contingent on stopping sin. You see what I'm saying here? See, if final salvation is conditional on stopping your sin, then initial salvation has to be likewise. Otherwise, man, God is not fair in asking man to come clean in repentance. You see how this works here? So we can't go out. If we, if we don't believe in moral depravity and original sin and that nonsense that was taught in the, in the so-called Reformation, that it basically boils down to there's no accountability and sin's not the issue and only unbelief is the issue. If we reject that, but we still insist that somehow God's got to offset the person. When the person comes up and he's crying and he's weeping and, he, and he's going to receive Jesus, that God has to do something miraculous at that point other than what he's already done by convicting him, bringing him to that point, convicting him of sin, righteousness, and judgment, outstretch his hand, not willing any should perish, other than what he's already did, well, then we're preaching the same message then. See, that's my contention here. Otherwise, God's not fair. See, if you consider it for a moment that your initial act of faith if that's enough to save you when you receive and confess, see, a lot of people are still stuck with that, we'll receive Jesus. No, it, you don't receive Jesus, you repent. What must I do to be saved? It's always repent and be converted of your sins. Acts 3.19, uh, 26, 18 through 21, many other places. Repent and be converted. I know you're going to say, well, he said believe. Well, believe encompasses all of this. We have to have a uniform understanding of what all these words mean. Otherwise, we're back in this camp. You might as well go back to the churches. A uniform understanding is that believe means follow and obey and take up your cross and strive. And all the things Jesus said mean believe. He might have said it 94 times in the book of John or some, somewhere along that line somebody posted. But it also meant that unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. What's he saying there? He's saying the same thing about crucifying your flesh with its passions and desires. That's what he's saying. That's John's version of repentance. About the condemnation that came into the world. That men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Everyone doing evil won't come to the light, at least their deeds be exposed. But those doing evil, Doing good deeds come to the light that their deeds are clearly seen that they're done in God. This is where the, root, the word is going to take root in the heart of a person that's been brought from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God through repentance, through the dynamic of preaching repentance on the premise of man's accountability. Man is 100% responsible for his sins. He's 100% accountable to God because he's have a free will choice to choose between right and wrong. Even as a scarlet sinner, addicted to his sins, he has not forfeited his will or his ability to obey God. That he has to be miraculously offset somehow or made